Hello everyone, welcome to our uh, uh, presentation this morning about our Sabbath School lesson, uh, the second lesson for the quarter, 2004 4th quarter. And so uh, last week, uh, but before we begin there, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, uh, uh, today we come to you for your uh, guidance and inspiration as we discuss our lesson uh, this morning. May it be that as uh, we go into the details, help us, Lord, to appreciate uh, the importance of family in uh, our education. Uh, thank you, Lord, for uh, giving us these principles. May it be that it will give us, help us uh, more uh, mature in, in, in following you and also in the rearing our children. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, uh, so uh, our lesson, uh, as I said last week, we discussed about, uh, uh, we discussed about uh, uh, Garden of Eden, uh, education at the Garden of Eden, uh, right uh, before the fall and after the fall, uh, right there. So now, uh, this week, uh, we are going to start uh, our discussion on uh, family after the fall. Uh, remember that the first family, Adam and Eve, have, uh, uh, you know, was kicked out of the Garden of Eden. I mean, banished according to the Bible. And so uh, they have children uh, right after there. So uh, and, uh, the family was uh, created. So... Uh, in order for us to uh, be able to go on with our discussion uh, uh, with the family, we need to, uh, uh, I need to present you the outline here, the introduction, uh, and then uh, the, f the first family, we are going to go talk about the childhood of Jesus, and then uh, I mean, talking about communications, and then the role of parents, and then lest you forget. Uh, and then uh, we are going to the uh, the brief summary of our discussion. So uh, in our Sabbath afternoon lesson, uh, it says, uh, "Let me read from uh, Proverbs verses chapter one verses one to eight. I'm going to use my uh, uh, this is uh, uh, Proverbs verses one to eight. My uh, iPhone to uh, uh, read uh, uh, the verses because uh, chapter 1 verses 8. Hear my son your father's instruction and uh, do not forsake your mother's teaching. Uh, here according to this verse what is the primary purpose of education in the home? Because we are talking now about the first uh, uh, education system after the Garden of Eden was in the family, family of Adam and Eve. As we expand in our knowledge of God and the world around what do we also learn? So since uh, in here, uh, <coughs> uh, since creation, the parents uh, or uh, the family unit have been responsible for educating uh, their children. Schools are meant to support and widen the education received in the family, not to replace it. And then uh, Christian parents must be aware that the responsibility, they should do everything in their power to support their children, their spiritual, moral, and intellectual development. And then uh, in details, we are going to do uh, discuss education in the family, the first family, and then the family of Jesus, and then the family today. And some suggestions, how to educate uh, communication and organization. So, in fact, uh, life itself is a school. Thus, the lesson begins and proceeds to demonstrate that the family is our first school room. No child is too young to begin hearing about the goodness of God. Songs and prayers of God's greatness should begin at cribside and continue till graveside. 
And uh, when I became a grandparents, uh, uh, I mean a grandpa uh, grandfather, daddy, uh, sometimes I have to be visit my grandchildren. And uh, you know, the, the very first, when they were still small, I, you know, to lula by them, I s sing them, uh, Jesus loves me, this I know. And until now, uh, this is our theme song. Uh, every time I uh, put them to, uh, you know, uh, nap time during daytime, I always sing that song, and they, they still remember. Uh, and it kind of, uh, you know, I mean, uh, to me, that, that's comforting that they remember the songs. And so Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, along with their wives, are honored with being this world's first family. And how hard it is for us to conceive what it would have been like to have a sum of human history looking across you at the breakfast table. The Garden of Eden, uh, lush but inaccessible, is still within their view, not to mention an angelic sentinel and his sword, sword of fire, guarding uh, no doubt an awful splendor of the sights inspires endless questions uh, from the young boys, uh, Abel and, uh, you know, and, and Cain and Abel, and the Creator, God, did that, and it would have been an answer to, to springs of why and how questions bubbling up from the boy's uh, curious mind. Adam and Eve, answers would have been based on their eyewitness accounts and personal experience of engagement with this Creator God. And... There have been primitive gospels shared that spoke of divine son who would one day be born to crush the head of the serpent and yet not without sacrifice to himself. Or in, in order to bring a uh, human family back to the garden and the way it should be. A picture of this divine son, childhood and education can be loosely constructed from the first chapter of Genesis. Uh, and Matthew, this picture pays a compliment of the value of education as Jesus takes the opportunity to learn from the, his heavenly father and instruct the priesthood in the temple. The lesson highlights communication, the avenue though which education comes. It makes the important point that building relationship is a key component for effective communication and teaching. This idea is further developed below. So, uh, in here, uh, in our Sunday's lesson, the first family, uh, what do the three starters of Genesis tell us about God? And so I was asking the, and thinking about this question, and what do these three chapters of Genesis tell us about God? And uh, reviewing the first three chapters uh, of Genesis indicates that God makes us creative. He values beauty. Uh, he loves variety, you know. Just like uh, look at variety of plants and flowers and rocks and everything around you. A variety on them. And you go to your vegetable garden, a variety. Of God was slow enough so that we can follow. He did not just, you know, uh, snap of a finger and then comes something else. He did it in six days. And most of all, God demonstrated a self-sacrificing love by giving us free will to choose. In spite of his immense power of God, as God, he sacrificed that prerogatives not to force us to follow him if we don't want to. Of course, choices have consequences. So uh, here uh, we can see that the first family... And he said, just in Genesis 3.15, I alluded to this idea. I will put enmity between you and woman, and between you and, uh, between you and your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Adam, uh, he, and Eve were children of God. God taught them, and the angels supported the education. When sin entered, uh, enter the world, the new subject uh, uh, the new subject was added the plan of salvation the plan of redemption 
Adam and Eve became the first teachers when Cain was born. The family became the heart of human education to this day. And children, oops, what happened here? And children learn about Christian doctrines and values within the family. They learn, they learn about loving God and accepting Jesus as their Savior and friend. And then Cain and Abel were educated the same way. But the outcome was quite different in its case. Unfortunately, education does not always produce the expected result. And so the, you have to bear that in mind. Uh, you teach them the same thing. And sometimes I ask, what did I do? You know, but, you know, sometimes uh, they have their own choice. And so uh, uh, education does not always produce the expected result. So in our Monday's lesson, we go to the childhood of Jesus. Uh, we are now going to the Adam family, to Jesus' family. And uh, the scripture gives us very little detail about the childhood of Jesus. But it, does, but it does give us insight into the values of his parents and therefore some of the things they would have taught him. So we can read it from Luke chapter 26 and uh, we can see here that Luke chapter 26 26, no, Luke chapter 1 verses, I mean chapter 1 verses 26 to 38. And now in the sixth month of the angel, Gabriel was sent from God to the city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David and the virgin name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, greetings. Favored one, the Lord is with you. If you notice that, the angel said, favored one. Mary was a favored one. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of situation uh, this was, salutation this was. And the great, the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You, you, have, fa you have found favor in God, with God. So the first one is that you are a favored one and then, the angel said again, you are favored with God. So, uh, and behold, you will conceive your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And uh, he will be a great, and he will be called the son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign forever. Uh, for, uh, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angels, how can this be? Since I am a virgin, and the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason the Holy Child will be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth also conceived a son of her old age, and she has called barren is now in her six months, for nothing will be impossible for God." And Mary said, Behold, the blood slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Mary visits Elizabeth. So if you notice, uh, there are some background in here. But if you notice, uh, <clears throat> if you notice uh, in our discussion this morning about the family of Jesus, we are moving from Eden family to Jesus family. Jesus' parents have a close walk with God before they have children. Mary had God's favor, as the angel said. Mary had a powerful presence of the Holy Spirit. She honored and respected God. And to Mary, God is an equalizer. If you read it from Luke chapter, chapter 1, 46 to 55, he said, she said, and Mary said, my soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior, for he has regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time, in all generations will count me blessed. 
For the mighty one has done great things for me, and the holy is his name. <clears throat> uh, and, and, and his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm and scattered those who were proud and threw their hearts. He has brought down rulers and their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and has sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy. And he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. So if you notice, Mary uh, had the vision or, or understanding of God is an equalizer. He, uh, everybody is uh, uh, equal to God. So uh, in our next slide, the family of Jesus, and uh, according to this text, Luke 2.40, the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom. And uh, the grace of God was upon him. God chose uh, parents of Mary very carefully as they are responsible for his education. Joseph, a righteous and obedient man, Matthew 1, 18 to 25, chapter 2, 13 to 15, and verses 19 to 23. Mary, a spiritual, intelligent, determined, obedient, humble, and helpful woman, she trusted God completely. And so both were upright people. And they knew uh, how to educate their children in God's love and obedience. God became Jesus' teacher and uh, as he grew in John 12, 49. And Jesus learned lessons from God that his earthly parents uh, couldn't even understand. So the account of the encounter between the pretend Jesus and the learned doctors of Jewish law during his Passover visit to Jerusalem is brief but dense. According to Ellen White, after three days they found him in the temple sitting among the teachers learning to them and asking them questions and all who heard him were amazed and understanding and his answers. So what makes Jesus the model student? To glean insights into the question, let's look at the following statement from Ellen White. Uh, from all that day, at that day, apartment connected with the temple was devoted to a sacred school after the manner of the schools of the prophets. Her leading rabbis, where their pupils assembled and hider the child Jesus came setting himself at the feet of the grave learned men. He, in, he listened to their instructions. As one seeking for wisdom, he questioned the teachers in regard to the prophecies and to events then taking place that pointed to the advent of the Messiah. Jesus presented himself as one thirsting for a knowledge of God. The doctors turned upon him with questions and they were amazed at his answers. With the humility of a child, he repeated the words of the scripture, giving the depth meaning that wise men had not conceived of. He followed the lines of truth he pointed out would have worked reformations in the, in the religion of the day. A deep interest in spiritual things would have been awakened. And when Jesus began his ministry, many would have been prepared to receive him. The rabbis knew that Jesus had not been instructed in their schools, yet his understanding and prophecies ex far exceeded theirs. In this thoughtful Galilean boy, they discerned great promise. They desired to gain him as a student, that uh, he might become a teacher in Israel. They wanted to have a charge of his education, feeling that a mind so original must be brought under their molding. The words of Jesus had moved their hearts and they had never before have been moved by words of human lips. The youthful modesty and grace of Jesus disarmed their prejudices. Unconsciously, their minds were opened in the word of God and the Holy Spirit spoke to their hearts.
hearts and it's found in Desire of Ages, page 78 to 80. Every Christian knows that Jesus is the teacher of teachers. But how about he is known as student of students? So what makes Jesus model a uh, student? He has a curiosity and hunger for knowledge of God and makes him an attractive listener. Attentive, I mean. Attentive listener. He asks questions showing that he is an active, not just passive learner. He is not reluctant to offer answers either. He shows that he can be vulnerable and put his ideas out in the table for others to judge, criticize, or affirm. This builds the resilience he will need when as an adult. His words will bring accusations of demon possessions, calls for his death, but as the boy who has been speaking of God since he was 12 years old, probably sooner, he could not be intimidated. Good students always make the best teacher. Of course, many, Mary thought, that strains my father's house, he said. That strains my husband doesn't own a temple. So she tried this, it with other things she had heard to us who he asked, he was. You remember, she treasured this in her heart. And what does it mean that at 12, Jesus already, in the light of the knowledge of the scripture, and his mother surely had a hand in training. <coughs> training uh, because they didn't have copies of the Bible on the shelf at home. You had to listen as people told you often from memory, and occasionally you had to go to the synagogues and hear it read on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew how to read the Bible. Remember when he stood up and read Isaiah, it would be in Hebrew, and he was able to read it. As they said, how could be such learned men when he never attended the rabbinical school? Which suggests that his Mother did a good job, and he was a self-educated man. So uh, that's how education of Jesus uh, appeared in, 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 in his time. So in Tuesday, communication. And uh, we're going to read some text here. What do the following text tells us about building strong relationship in the family or in a classroom? So let me read from Psalms, uh, book of Psalms, <clears throat> chapter 37, verses 7 to 8. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way because of the man who carries the wicked. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to avoiding. So, <clears throat> uh, Psalms is suggesting that we need to be patient, building strong relationship, and do not always complain. Because uh, children hear this. Proverbs, again, in Proverbs, uh, <clears throat> Proverbs 10, 31 to 32. Let me read. The mouth of the righteous flows with wisdom, but the perverted tongue will be cut out. The lips of the righteous bring forth what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked what is perverted. So there is always wisdom. So uh, it is not only important what we say, but how we say it. Can you think of times when the way you said something ruined the impact of what you said, even if what you said was correct? And this is a very important question because there was a time that I was trying to correct one of my child, you know, one of my children. And until now, it cannot be forgotten. 
because I said it in the wrong way. It was very, very, you know, uh, unacceptable uh, uh, if I listen it back. Had, you know, I, I want to go back there again and, rep, uh, you know, correct myself, but it's too late. And until, you know, so uh, there is a suggestion in communications. The left, the right use, we read that already. And appropriate communication is essential, very essential in our education system. That uh, appropriate communication is essential in education. Parents must devote their time communicating, you know, uh, commun with their children, not just talking, but also listening to them. See, communication is two-way process. It's also talking and also listening. Because if you do not li listen, there is no communication. Communication must include an emotional side too. Parents should show love in every action. And we should always ask God for wisdom on how to properly imprint the Christian values on the hearts of our children by using our words and our example. So I have some slides here. Uh, it says, the time we spent communicating with each member of our family will be worth it. I have some checklists, questions that I'd like to uh, uh, suggest uh, for us to consider. Uh, the question is, how, how frequently do parents and children share matters of the heart with each other? Does a child feel safe to share hopes, fears, and troubles with his or her parents. Uh, the next question is, uh, it says, do parents continually seek to affirm whether the child is doing well or does a child only hear criticisms when he or she makes mistakes? This is very important questions. And it's up to us because affirming is very important in the development, emotional development of a child. If they hear criticism, they will become a negative thinker and uh, always, you know, and it will carry on. Are the parents patient as the child stumbles along learning new activities or responsibilities? You know, uh, I, I am looking now at different, uh, uh, <clears throat> I wish I had, I was there when I was, uh, my children are growing up. I have to work full time. My, my, my wife has to, uh, to stay with them and I was not there, uh, you know. I only see them in the evening, live in the morning. And so many times, uh, you know, uh, it, it's up to the mother to, you know, take care of that. So are the parents, as a child stumbles along in learning new activities or responsibilities. And though the parents, Express empathy toward the children, remembering what it was like to be a child themselves. And this is very important. So, and then the next slide is some more, uh, do the parents gently guide the children to have a relationship with God or this simply ramrod religious instruction in sin? You know, when uh, my son was uh, a teenager, uh, he was, uh, I was uh, asking him a question, uh, you know, uh, your peers uh, have been baptized already, and how about you? And uh, he, he asked me a request, uh, can you give me Bible study? You know, because uh, this is one important aspect of our rearing children in Christian education. So I gave him Bible studies. I have the guides uh, about, the, you know, the fundam fundamental belief of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, biblical study uh, as a teenager. And, you know, and then he was baptized later on. And so uh, in our next slide here, uh, are parents secure and ad adult enough to admit to their children when they make mistakes and to ask forgiveness? Or did they continually maintain a facade of perfection that the children say through anyway. Oh yeah, I have, I have uh, sometimes been impatient and uh, as a father and sometimes I want them to do this and that 
and yet uh, I, mean, I realized that uh, it was not good. So sometimes, many times, I had to, you know, apologize for being being impatient uh, with my method of teaching. But the mom is always, uh, you know, there to to support, and uh, you know, uh, have the parents devoted time to give exclusive attention to their children, though they play with their children. See, this is this this will take time. Time is very important with the children, you know. And uh, instead of <coughs> giving them gifts, I think it's it's more important for us to have giving them our time. And uh, this is one important. Has respect been cultivated and earned between both parents and child? There must be some respect that is to be. Though the parents apply discipline in a calm, controlled environment or impulsively in frustration or anger. And this one here is, I learned something. When any of my child does something and needs uh, some disciplining, I have to give them a warning. When we get home, we need to talk about it. And we have to agree about the consequence. I just do not impose my, you know, the what I want. And then sometimes, you know, it, it, it hurts. But uh, see, do they communicate? Do they communicate uh, <clears throat> the idea of questions? Do they communicate words and actions of love and tender care to the child? so that the child knows what they love, that they love him or her unconditionally. You know, and uh, I was watching uh, my son dealing with this boy, uh, the only son they have. And I really so admire that uh, being a father, he is so patient with the baby. And... No, uh, this is one thing that they have to be able to, uh, you know, uh, when, when communicating words and actions of love, sometimes, you know, when uh, a child uh, demands something, and sometimes uh, you have to control, and yet uh, we need patience, communicate words of actions of love and tender care to a child, so that the child knows that they love him or her. Unconditionally. And so uh, those questions, these questions are important. Regardless of how dedicated parents are in inculcating Adventist religious instructions to their children, if the core issues that the question just mentioned address are not interwoven into their parenting philosophy, it all may be for nothing. And there are moments when it is time to put down the textbooks, take a break from chores, and instead spend quality time with your kids. Play, invest in relationship, and the dividends are likely to be an effective education, culminating in a lifelong commitment to Christ and eternal life. So, but we need to remember that, uh, you know, uh, uh, education doesn't always result in what we wanted. And uh, that is uh, visible in, in the Garden of Eden, uh, right outside there where uh, Adam and Eve uh, wasn't able to uh, really perfect the education training of the children. Wednesday, the role of parents. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Let me read Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instructions to the Lord. Do not provoke. And let me read again from Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. 
But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. Gentleness, self-control against such things, there is no law. So how does one avoid provoking children to wrath? We need to have, uh, you know, the, the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Because if we do not have that fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives, you know, uh, patient, we are not patient, we are not, it says here, uh, peace, patience, kind, goodness, faithfulness. Gentleness, self-control. We need those virtues. How do you find a virtuous wife? In Proverbs 31.10. Let me read it again there. Proverbs 31.10. Proverbs 31.10. Verse 10 says, An excellent wife who can find for her worth as far above jewels. How does one develop the fruit of the Holy Spirit? What rules do each of this play in a proper education of children within the family? So these three texts give us a clue of what uh, you know, needs to be in a proper education of children within the family. Patient, gentle, calm, and the mother is also a uh, very important uh, role in disciplining our children. Educating, I mean, not disciplining. Education is uh, very important. And uh, Galatians chapter, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We need those. Please, uh, we need to pray to give uh, that the Holy Spirit will allow us that those fruits be part of our lives so that we can, you know, the, 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 our children will know they will know that uh, when we are uh, uh, have those. So there is a song. It says that uh, something happened to daddy. So, you know, uh, you remember those songs. And so, uh, and you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. So fathers are the head of the family. So he is responsible for representing Christ's character at home. And so, uh, uh, this is very important because we as father, uh, being representing Christ's character at home uh, in Ephesians, the mother is the greatest influence in personality, character, and temperament of the child, of the children. And so, uh, <coughs> parents must work together in educating their children. And uh, in the Bible, parents are told to teach their children how to love God and obey Him. In Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6, 4 to 9. And Christians will be responsible for their actions once they become adults. I mean, children will be responsible for their actions once they become adult. However, parents are responsible for planting the seed uh, in them that they will grow for eternal life. See, because of the power of choice, uh, they always have, uh, you know, their own freedom to do whatever they want. But if we plant a seed in their mind and their heart, uh, they will, you know, not depart from it. So both parents and teachers are in danger of commanding and dictating too much while they fail to come sufficiently into a social relationship with their children and their scholars. They maintain too great a reverse and exercise their authority in a cold, unsympathetic manner, uh, which tends to repel instead of winning confidence and affection. If they would, uh, if they would oftener gather their children about them and manifest an interest in their work, and even in their sports, they would gain the love and confidence of the little ones. And the lesson of respect and obedience would be far more readily learned. For love uh, is the best teacher, 
a similar interest manifested in the youth will secure like results, the young heart is quick to respond to the touch of sympathy. Ellen White said in Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 58. So, uh, uh, in our thesis lesson, lest ye forget Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6, 1 to 9. Deuteronomy 6, 1 to 9. Said, Obey God and prosper. Now is the commandment, the statutes, and the judgment which the Lord your God has committed, commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it. Uh, the background here is now the Israelites are about to go across the Jordan River to possess the promised land. And Moses wrote this instruction before the, the cross the river. So that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. There is a promise of a long life if you do this. O Israel, verse 3, you should listen and be careful to do it, that they might be well with you and that you may multiply greatly just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. For these words which I am commanding you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and your sons and you shall ask of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be in the frontal of your forehead. You shall write them in the doorpost of your house and on your gates, then it shall come about when the Lord of God, your God, brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you the great and splendid city which you did not build. So here, the instruction uh, Moses uh, gave to the Israelites before they crossed the river Jordan. What can we learn from this chapter? about the principles of Christian education. Teach them. Talk to them about it. You know, anytime uh, you're lying down at work, playing, you know, the principles is, what is this verses should be absolutely central to all our education. So, you know, uh, this text gives us an idea of uh, very important uh, educational tool and organizations, it says, <clears throat> this commandments that I gave you today to be in your hearts, it is an education of the heart. We must organize our schedule in a way that there is always time to educate our children. And then it is important to set a specific time apart from sharing God's wisdom and promises with our children. And Pray with them and schedule a morning and or evening family worship. Uh, this uh, tell the children uh, a Bible story before they go to bed. Story time. And, you know, when God lived among us in human form, he was God and he didn't say, give me your questions. Here are the answers and I expect you to believe it. Because it could have been the devils masquerading as Christ God himself and led them through the evidence when they had come to the intelligent confidence based on unquestionably evidence he was satisfied and when he revealed who he was. Now think what they say about our God and the way he runs his universe. He does not ask us to believe without evidence, but think of what it says about our methods. And so this is very important because... What kind of God is God this say in your family? You know, those are the questions. If Adventists are going to finish the work, 
they will become the best explainers of the evidence. In other words, we won't just leave details of Bible instructions to the folks we call Bible workers or Bible instructors. Every loyal member of the family worth his salt will be a Bible instructor and able to explain the scripture as Philip in the chariot. That's our mission. We should be the best teaching explainers in the whole world. If we want to have a no to be known for anything other than the picture of God, our highest calling would be to the very careful, accurate, and interesting explainers of the content of the 66 books, the Bible. That would be, I think, the highest thing that we could aspire to. So besides, can you think of the better illustrations of the difficulties God faces in helping us children to grow up and become free individuals than to develop a family? I mean, isn't it difficult to start with our those totally dependent little children and after several years send them into the world standing on their own feet? How fast do you give them freedom? Are you able to discipline them and yet in love and have them love the, you just the same? We really are like God in our, to our children. Are you willing to respect the freedom of your children so much that when they are old enough to pack their bags, you are willing to let them go? God let these children go. You know, sometimes in a family where some of our children don't stay loyal, we say the parents must have done a bad job. Well, none of us does, prefer, does a perfect job. Would anyone like to suggest that God has, was a bad parent? And that's why he lost so many of his angelic children right there in heaven, one third of them. He did a perfect job in a perfect environment, and he lost Adam and Eve. And many of his angels loyal so. So we ought to be very careful what we say about parents who may be experiencing difficulty and disappointment with some of our children. What about God? And then what about the respect of the freedom? Did God create us capable of loving him and trusting him or Hate eating of him and spitting on his face. We know we can do that. It's been done. He created us free. So, you know, this is very important because, hey, somebody, you know, uh, teach a child how to follow the right way. Even when he is old, he will stay on the course. But not, at all, not all of them. There are some of our children who, does, who won't do this. Because of the free will. And we have to respect that. It's hard. It's hard, you know. Sometimes uh, when they rebel against us, uh, the, this question, the discussion question is whether we have children or not. We all live in a, some sort of dwelling and we all interact with others as well. Ka what can we learn from this? Listen, that will impact our relationships. We tend to view education as a good thing. But is this always the case? What type of education could actually have a negative impact rather than a positive one? As children move toward adulthood, when and how should parents let go? What is the greatest key to children adopting the faith of the parents? And so these are the questions. These are the questions that we have been asking. And so there is a research within the Adventist church. Have you heard about the value genesis? It's a research study into the faith and values of young people attending seven Adventist high schools in North America in the three areas of family, school, and church. And the first survey was conducted in 1990 second major survey was conducted in the year 2000, and the third took place in 2010. And I have a slide here about the value genesis 
research, the largest research project undertaken thus far to assess the attitude of seven Adventist young people. Few can talk about youth or even the church today without referring to this landmark study. And 20 years of research has shown that the following three items have the most retention among young people as they become adults. Number one, they have fun family worship. You know, this is very important. The children would recall, when I was growing up, uh, my, my growing up in an Adventist family, you know, we grew up in a farm, and sometimes uh, my parents has to go to the farm early in the morning, you know, to, to, to avoid the, the heat of the sun uh, later on. So they have to go early in the morning, and they have to wake us up early in the morning and do worship. And it was so difficult. It was a struggle. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, I could remember I was pretending I was sleeping, and yet, you know, they sing a song, you know, the Lord in the morning, and am I, yes, so guilty. <laughs> it was not fun at all, you know, waking up early in the morning. But, see, I, but I still remember those uh, family worship <laughs> sometimes. But we need to have fun family worship. You do not just say, hey, sit down there and, you know, uh, sit down and behave. It should be fun. Fun like playing games, in the Bible games, something like that. Fun family worship. Songs. They have to learn songs. Actions. And, you know, th th these are methods in which we can have fa fun family worship. Number two, casual faith. Where parents are heard by their children talks about God as part of their conversation casually. Meaning to say that parents just doesn't, you know, uh, matter when it comes to conversation. God is part and partial of that conversation. It's become natural instead of a controlled environment that we can only talk about God during worship. No, it was casual conversation, casual faith. That's what it means. That, you know, every time uh, there is a subject, uh, you know, God becomes part of, uh, of the element of that conversation. And so, they, because parents, you know, children listen to our conversation as parents. And once they heard about the picture of who God is in our lives, and we talk about the goodness of God in their own daily living. You know, they catch those ideas. And it becomes part of their, you know, uh, the, their, their habits and their attitudes. And number three is, allow them, the children, to ask hard questions. Challenging and difficult questions. Without put down. Let them challenge you. Let them ask anything they want. You know, this is very important. Uh, when, when a child grows up, she says, why? Why is that so? You know, and sometimes we get annoyed. Why, why, why? How, how is that? But, and yet, you know, we have to be patient dealing with this kind of challenging questions. Because when we respond to them in a very kind, patient manner, and in a correct way, biblical centered then you know uh, we we the, it becomes you know the thinking the pattern of the you know your their you know mind it becomes part of them and when they be grow up it, it be, so i really admire that one time i was driving a car uh, with my son i was picking him up from school and uh, I told him about, uh, uh, you know, I was giving a devotional worship about, uh, you know, what kind of God is God? And uh, he asked the question, so what did you present? And I said, I presented, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the idea of uh, Hosea, a relationship with Israel. And he asked a lot of questions about, you know, how, how is that, how is that? 
God is so powerful and yet uh, he is giving us so much freedom. And I told him, that's who he is. That's God. That's how God deals with us. He, he has the power and yet, you know, he, 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 he respects our choices. He respects our freedom. And you know what? And this is, uh, you know, how he interacts with, uh, with his peers and with his, uh, uh, you know, and, and sometimes I see it. It's so pleasing to know that uh, those, those precious times that we have been together, uh, even driving time, we can talk about it, about God, uh, you know, in an hour. Yeah. And so this is, and I'm, I'm very, very pleased about the result. Ellen White said, God desires to see gathered out from the homes of our people a large company of youth who, because of the godly influence of their homes, have surrendered their hearts to him and go forth to give him a highest service in their lives. Directed and trained by the godly instruction of the home, the influence of morning and evening seasons of worship, as I've said, fun family worship, the consistent example of parents who love and fear God, as I mentioned, about casual faith. They have learned to submit to God as their teacher and leader. So here, uh, principles in which it was been written places in July 27, 22, somewhere in the 1900, been, been really examined. So... To summarize our uh, discussion this morning, uh, I already have over the time here. Let me briefly go through the, uh, the summary of our education, the family. Pay close attention to your father's wise words and never forget your mother's instruction. This is in Proverbs 1.8. And then the family home is the place where we model the relationship we personally have with our Heavenly Father. You know, they see us as like God. And if we have a wrong a picture of us representing Him, they have also a wrong picture of who God is. The very words which Jesus Himself had spoken, He was now taught at His mother's knee. You know, mom is very important. Mary taught Jesus Christ the principles uh, that he, had, he was growing up. A true teacher gives the gift of companionship. Here, being a parent is very important in educating our children. We accompany them. We, we go with them. We, we, you know, we feel how they feel. We have the empathy. And, you know, uh, in their failures, we need to, you know, give them comfort and, uh, you know, go, go with them in this. The parental, the parental role is perhaps the most important uh, in our society. So uh, the most rapid development in a child's education is in the hands of their parents. Now parents, if you have your children here, you have a responsibility that is solemn and uh, representing God is very important in our family. And I hope that uh, uh, we, we have these uh, principles to guide you. Uh, there are some of you more experts than me. And I wish that this lesson is being discussed in our classroom, and yet we are not here. So uh, uh, this is all the best we can. Let's pray. The Lord, thank you so much for uh, giving us the privilege of this presentation. May it be that as we apply this in our lives, that we can be able to be the model that you want us to be to our children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.